In Platinum, there are only two dragon types available, not counting legendaries. So even though dragons are incredibly powerful, it could be very tough to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke, where the rules state that any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever, no items from the bag are allowed in battle, set mode is mandatory, and very importantly, you're not allowed to level past the next gym leader. But here's the thing, you can't actually get your first dragon, Gibble, until after the second gym. So to see if dragons could even make it that far into the game, I decided to make Gibble the replacement for my starter. Now right off the bat, I wasn't so excited about the lax nature I got, but more importantly than that, the IV of one it had in speed. During my research to see if this run is even remotely possible, I realized that I needed a speed IV of at least four with a non-speed boosting nature to have the chance to outspeed certain threats, which means I have effectively lost attempt one. So to set me up for as much success as possible, I reset for a total of six more times, at which point I got myself a jolly gibble. I name him Sharknado after the amazing movie, and at level seven, he learns the move Dragon Rage, which is a 100% accurate move that always deals 40 damage. Also, I'm gonna be avoiding as many trainers as possible, not just to keep my only Pokemon from overleveling the gyms, but also to avoid getting a bunch of random EVs since we mostly wanna spec into speed and attack for our purposes. So what is this? Score, it's a town map. Yeah, now you can find your way to Loserville. <laughs> the first gym we have to face is versus Rourke, and you'll note that I put the level cap at level 15, which is actually supposed to be 14. However, I did go in at level 10, so it didn't end up making a difference. One thing that does make a huge difference, though, is that Dragon Rage will one-shot most Pokemon below level 15. Geodude's the first victim of our Draconic Fury, and second out is Cranidos. After lowering Sharknado's defense with a Leer, we go for a Dragon Rage, but Cranidos actually happens to have above 40 HP, so we leave it just in the red. This prompts Rourke to use one of his potions, but since they only heal 20 HP, another Dragon Rage is of course enough to take Cranidos out. Rourke's final Pokemon is an Onix, but since at level 12 it doesn't seem to have 40 HP, we just one-shot it with Dragon Rage and claim our first gym badge. Now, while there are only two encounters available to us, I am going to be catching a Bidoof and potentially some other Pokemon to use HMs throughout the run. So if you ever see more than one or two Pokemon in my party, that's the reason why. After our new rodent friend breaks some rocks for us, we get to the next challenge, Mars. And to prepare for this fight and many to come, I made sure to go back to Route 201 and take out level two Starlies to get as many speed EVs as possible. This will let us outspeed the Zubat right away, and since it doesn't have 40 HP, a Dragon Rage is enough to clean take it out. However, no matter what we do, we're not going to be outspeeding Mars's per ugly. The first turn, it goes for a fake out, dealing 12 points of damage, which is a pretty sizable chunk of our full HP. Scratch then takes Gibble below half, activating my Ornberry, getting me back to 33 HP. A Dragon Rage then takes per ugly deep into the yellow, but it's got an Ornberry of its own, healing back up to almost half. Another Scratch does about a quarter of Sharknado's HP, but at this point, another Dragon Rage is enough to seal the deal, meaning that Mars really wasn't that bad, which is not something I can say for Saturn. I don't know about you guys, but I really appreciate the Sinnoh lore more after Legends Arceus, since they confused Dialga and Palkia for the same Pokemon, it just makes this statue so much more meaningful. But we're not in Eterna City to look at statues, we're here to face Gardenia. And because our opponents are getting stronger, we need a new strategy instead of just Dragon Rage go burr. And so, my first order of business is use a Rock Tomb on this Turtwig, not to lower its speed, but just to get a bit of chip damage as it uses Reflect. I then set up Sandstorm to maybe utilize my Sand Veil ability, which pays off right away as the Turtwig misses a Razor Leaf. Dragon Rage is then enough to take it out because of that chip damage. Gardenia's second Pokemon is a Cherim that misses its first Leech Seed, which already doesn't have perfect accuracy, as I can nail it with a Dragon Rage. To increase the chances of things going my way, I equip Sharknado with a Quick Claw, which does proc against Cherim, taking it out with a second Dragon Rage. This perfectly leaves us at full HP versus Gardenia's Roserade. And immediately Sand Veil pays off again as it misses a Stun Spore. This means I've gotten three Sand Veil misses in this fight, but all against moves that weren't 100% accuracy in the first place. However, Magical Leaf of course can't miss and it takes us down way below half, but another Dragon Rage is going to be enough to take out the Rose Raid, getting us the second Gym Badge. This means we're almost to the point in the game where we can actually get Gibble with one more obstacle standing in our way, Jupiter. And this girl can be a massive problem in any Platinum run since Skuntank is such a strong Pokemon for this stage in the game. I immediately start the fight by going for a Sandstorm against Zubat as it amazingly misses a Wing Attack. The next turn, because of all those IVs, I can outspeed the Zubat, taking it out with a Rock Tomb. This just leaves the stinky boy. <laughs> 
It outspeeds us and goes for a Night Slash, which luckily doesn't crit and takes us below half, but I heal up with an Orin Berry. Now, I could go for a Dragon Rage here, doing as much damage as possible, but I decide to go for a Rock Tomb just to lower Skuntank's speed. This means I can outspeed the next turn going for a Dragon Rage, however, Skuntank does have a Citrus Berry of its own, making it look like it's a 3-hit KO. But the Skuntank then fortunately misses a Night Slash, giving me the opportunity to take it down into the red with a Dragon Rage. It does connect with the following Night Slash, but it doesn't get a crit, leaving me at just 7 HP. This means we can outspeed the next turn, taking out the Skuntank with a Dragon Rage, just barely making it to where we can actually get Gibble. And ironically, it's on my way to Wayward Cave that Sharknado gets to level 24, evolving into a Gabite. Since we already have a Gibble, we don't actually have to go to Wayward Cave to get one, but there is incentive to go since we can still pick up the TM for Earthquake. It's going to be insanely useful, being one of the best moves in the game all the way since Generation 1, but it's not going to come in useful right away. Because of course, every single Pokemon on Fantina's team's got Levitate. We also don't have access to any super effective moves, and on top of that, Miss Magus hits like a truck that's been training MMA since birth with an oddly fashionable hat. As you can tell, Fantina is not going to be a walk in the park. She starts out with a Duskull, which could burn us with Will-O-Wisp, and if we get burned, the run is pretty much over, which is why I equipped Sharknado with a Rostberry. As I set up Sandstorm the first turn, the Duskull does connect with a Will-O-Wisp burning us, but the Rostberry heals it right off. I then go for a Dragon Rage, which doesn't take out the Duskull, but it fortunately misses that Will-O-Wisp. Having Duskull in the red here is actually pretty good, since it's going to bait out one of Fantina's super potions. On top of that, it'll let Sharknado use Dragon Rage twice, taking out the the Duskull and eliminating the chance to get burned. Now we are going to outspeed Miss Magius because of all those speed EVs, hitting it down below half with a Dragon Rage as it heals up with Citrus Berry. And right after that, it does end up missing a Shadow Ball because of Sand Veil, and I didn't realize until a few turns later how impactful this miss actually was. You see, the next Shadow Ball does connect, taking me down just below half, prompting Fantina to use a Super Potion on Miss Magius. If it would have hit both Shadow Balls, it would have been game over right here, and we would have probably had to reinvest a bit in special defense before tackling Fantina again, but so far Sandvale has been pulling its weight way more than I expected it to. As Haunter comes in, I hit it with a Dragon Rage and then get hit by a critical hit Shadow Claw, leaving me at just 10 HP. We are then able to outspeed the Haunter, taking it out with a Dragon Rage, claiming a pretty amazing third gym badge. I got something cool. What is- oh, a subscription to Antler Boy. That is cool. Moving on to Veilstone City, there are a few important things we can pick up. And unfortunately, to get those things, we have to be a bit irresponsible. But hey, Looker's doing it, so it's okay, right? You see, at the game corner, we can pick up some pretty awesome TMs, and namely Sword Stance, without which I don't think we can beat Wake. There's no way a plan like that could go wrong, right? But before we worry about Wake, we have to take on Maylene, who's got a very strong Lucario. Lucario's base speed is at a deceptively low 90, and since Gabite sits at an 82, with a 10% boost from a Jolly Nature, that puts it at an effective 90.2. So a Jolly Nature Gabite is just faster than Lucario at base, but even if the Lucario had a speed boosting nature and max IVs, I'd still outspeed it with all the EVs I've invested in the speed stat. And for this reason, this gym is incredibly free since we have a super effective Earthquake to knock out the Lucario with, which also takes out her other Pokemon with ease. I'd rather be in the pool than in the sea. The salty tang of the sea tastes like my tears after a hard day of work. Uh, lady, you need a new job. If we return to Route 201, Wild Starlies have a chance of holding Yachi Berries. Now the thing is, Gabite can't actually get Thief, so I had to use Thief with Steve, who is otherwise our HM Pokemon, but I figured this is sort of like an HM, and we're probably not going to be able to beat this run without Yachi Berries anyway, so it's a gray area that I have allowed. Crasher Wake is possibly our biggest obstacle. Not only does he have Ice and Dragon moves, the guy starts out the fight with a Gyarados, which means our attack is going to be lowered by 33% from Intimidate, and so I figured Great, we'll just EV train in defense and HP to be able to take at least two hits from Gyarados, letting us use Sword Stance twice, getting to plus three, and we can sweep his team. Except when I was doing the research for this run, I must have been looking at Garchomp because Gabite does not learn Sword Stance, and because of that, the fight versus Wake went like this. Now listen, I suppose there's an alternate timeline where I could dodge enough with Sandvale to conceivably get through this fight, but at this point, nothing short of a miracle could beat Wake. And so after getting intimidated, I set up my sandstorm, but Darude's spirit had left me. My faith was shaken, and as Gyarados landed a waterfall, I realized I was 
probably gonna have to scrap this run. Not even the fact that I somehow land a critical hit Rock Tomb taking Gyarados down into the red was enough to make me believe. A second waterfall had me joining the Gyarados down in the red as a hyper potion from Wake heals Gyarados all the way up to full. I then go for a Dragon Rage doing less than half as a Rock Tomb the following turn takes it into a range where another Dragon Rage would kill. At this point, I did figure it would already be over, but the Gyarados does end up missing a brine, so at least we can take out the Gyarados, sending in Floatzel. But just before that happens, the Sandstorm subsides. I did end up preparing for this moment, having enough speed EVs to outspeed the Floatzel. I also learned that Earthquake after Intimidate even does above half as it heals up with a Citrus Berry. But after that, the run comes to an end. I was devastated. After so much planning and getting one simple detail wrong, I put one and a half days into this project. I was very heavily considering just cutting my losses, scrapping the whole thing, and moving on to the next project I'd planned, a randomizer with a twist I was really looking forward to. But first I took a look if there was any other strategy, and I found one. Not a great one, but I was at least willing to spend the rest of the day giving it a couple of attempts. I decided to start from where the run actually begins, right after Eterna when we can catch Gibble. This saved me some time, and after resetting for another few jolly Gibbles and losing to Fantina twice, I'd finally reached Veilstone again to pick up another TM. With this strategy, I was going to give it a couple of attempts at most, likely just scrapping the run, but what follows is why you're watching this right now. Once again, it was time to face Crasher Wake, and this time I had a different degenerate evasion strat in mind. You see, Sandvale doesn't give you that much of an evasion boost, but Double Team can stack on itself and you get to keep it forever, unlike Sandvale which disappears with the sand. And I figure I might as well give it a shot to see if this run is even possible. So after setting up my first Double Team, I immediately get hit by a waterfall that takes me down to a nice 69 health. I then go ahead and set up a second Double Team, this time successfully dodging the waterfall. The plan here is just to get as many double teams as possible, but unfortunately as I set up my third, I get hit by another waterfall, taking me down deep into the yellow. I figure it's pretty much lost at this point, so I fire off a Dragon Rage as he misses a Brine. I then throw another Dragon Rage at him as his Brine misses again. Finally, another Dragon Rage is enough to take out Gyarados, getting us to level 38. Now this does give us three more HP and just a little bit more offensive power, but we still have to go up against two Pokemon, the first being Floatzel. I know I'll outspeed speed because of my EVs, I also know that Earthquake is a 3-hit KO. What I didn't know is that I was going to get a critical hit, taking it out instantly. But we're still not out of the woods since we still have to face the bulky Quagsire. I go for an Earthquake here, and at minus one, I still think it's doing a bit more than a Dragon Rage. The Quagsire then hits back with a Water Pulse that doesn't miss, and it leaves it at just 2 HP, meaning that that level up was incredibly clutch. I go for another Earthquake, knowing that it's going to leave the Quagsire in the red as it attacks me with a mud shot, but misses the attack. There's definitely a Hyper Potion incoming from Wake side of things here, and as long as I can just dodge a few more hits, maybe we can have this. So I fire off another Earthquake, hoping that I can maybe dodge just one more hit, but I end up getting another critical hit, taking out the Quagsire. And honestly, guys, I was just going to scrap this run, and you'd be watching something else right now, but we actually made it. And the next thing we get to do is possibly the most welcome change in any Nuzlocke that I've ever played, we get to catch our second Pokemon, Swablu. And while using Sharknado has thus far been a natural disaster, at this point, I'm on Cloud9. Naturally, Swablu isn't a Dragon type though, so we have to level her up to evolve into an Altaria. And after going back to the early routes to get as many special attack and speed EVs as I could get by level 37, she is looking pretty good. The bashful nature isn't ideal, but neutral is always really good in Nuzlocke's. But even though we have a second team member, there are still a lot of challenges ahead of us. The main issue we have going forward is that we have to face quite a few ice types, the first of which being Cyrus's Sneasel. It has Ice Punch instead of Ice Shard, but I did give Altaria a Yache Berry just in case we missed the Fire Blast so that we could tank one and have a bit better chance. But we don't miss the first one, so we can pick ourselves up a Dragon Fang and move on to Canalave City. Now, so far, I haven't gotten into the rival fights too much, but from here on out, they can actually be pretty tricky, especially with only two Pokemon. As he leads with Serac, 
Raptor to intimidate me, I send in Cloud9, who doesn't care about the attack drop. I then go for a Dragon Breath, which so perfectly lines up with Altaria's mouth, which does a little bit over half, as the Star Raptor just sets up a double team. We do, however, land the Dragon Breath the next turn, taking out the Star Raptor. Barry then sends in Rapidash, but since this thing only has not very effective and normal moves, I decide to start setting up with Dragon Dance here. I did get intimidated at the start of the fight, so I go for three instead of two Dragon Dances to double my attack stat, and from there I can take out every single one of Barry's Pokemon with a fly each. I gotta say, I'm very glad to have Altaria on the team. We then pretty much immediately have to take on the 6th gym leader, Byron. And it feels incredibly good to finally face a gym where we have the advantage. His first Pokemon is Magneton, which is quad weak to Earthquake, so we put an end to that thing fairly quickly. The only thing I really had to plan for on Byron's team was Steelix. It's got a huge base defense, meaning that Earthquake was guaranteed to not take it out, doing just a little bit over half. And since this thing has Ice Fang, I had to equip Sharknado with a another Yachtshe Berry. This allowed me to survive with more than half of my health to spare, taking it out with another Earthquake. Finally, he's got his ace Pokemon Bastiodon, but since this thing, a Rock Steel type, is quad weak to our Stab Earthquake, it's game over pretty quickly, and we gain our sixth Gym Badge. That felt more like it should feel to use Dragon Pokemon. Once I defeated Byron, it was time to take out the Galactic Commanders, and while things got pretty dicey versus Saturn, Mars was a bit easier to defeat, which means it's time to head to the dreaded snow. Like, I can't imagine a less suitable environment for my team. So to heat up, I headed to the Fuego Ironworks to pick up the TM for Flamethrower, and I backtracked to Celestic Town to pick up the Choice Specs. Candace's team is incredibly dangerous to us, to say the least. Frostlass under Snowcloak could dodge her attacks. It also has a base 110 speed, and it takes Altaria to be EV trained all the way to the max in speed just to outspeed it. The other problem then becomes Sneasel, since if I want to hold the Choice Specs, I can't have a Yachi but I did do the calcs and I can survive one non-crit ice shard. And so, with the preparations out of the way, let's do this. The reason I need the choice specs in the first place is because Altaria's base 70 special attack is not enough to one-shot anything. Right off the bat, I was incredibly baffled that she didn't go for the quad effective ice shard, but I'll certainly take it and just one-shot the Sneasel with a flamethrower. Second out is Frostlass, and because of the EVs, we can outspeed, and can I just say it's not as satisfying to use flamethrower as dragon breath with this thing. It's like it's shooting out of its eye. Regardless, she did for some reason send in Frostlass before her Obama Snow, which means it didn't have the Snow Cloak ability, which is great for me since I don't have to risk the miss. Her final Pokemon is Piloswine, but none of her Pokemon actually stand up to the power of Specs Altaria, and I'm both incredibly surprised and relieved that we didn't get more trouble from an Ice-type gym. Moving on, it's Galactic time. This gathering of Team Galactic, what's the meaning of it? Fellow members of Team Galactic, hear me! <laughs> Quite the performance, no? Mesmerizing for one only 27 years old. Hold on, Cyrus isn't like 54? Before heading to Spear Pillar, since the level cap is now 50, we can get Gabite to level 48 and finally get ourselves a Garchomp. It's been a long wait, but oh goodness, are you worth it. Getting to Spear Pillar, of course, means we have a few difficult fights ahead of us, the first being the double battle versus the Galactic Commanders. I didn't do a ridiculous amount of planning for this fight, but I figured that if I could just take one side down first, that would set me up pretty good to beat the fight. So I began by taking out the first Bronzor. I then used an Earthquake to take care of the Skun Tank and swapped out into Altaria to deal with the Golbat. Once I'd taken care of one side, the other fell shortly thereafter. But this really isn't the Team Galactic fight that you're afraid of when playing Platinum. What is this pressure I feel? Something is enraged. Getting into the distortion world, I was finally going to get to make use of my sword stance TM. Because it's time to face the big bad boss Cyrus. And this fight is a notorious run killer in Platinum, and if I lose, I'm just dropping the run. And right off the bat, I go for that strategy we never got to use versus Wake, and set up to plus two with sword stance right away as I get hit by a will-o'-wisp which burns me, but I do have the Rostberry to heal it off. Now I definitely didn't have to set up against this Houndoom to be able to take it out with an Earthquake. However, I know that Gyarados is coming in later, and it will use Intimidate to lower my attack. Next is Weavile, which has Ice Punch instead of Ice Shard, so I know I'm going to outspeed because of my 172 EVs and my Jolly Nature. And it's pretty nice to put Weavile in the past. Thirdly, he does send in the Gyarados, which is going to use Intimidate, getting me down to just plus one. And as bad as it feels to have to rely on a 90% accurate Rock Slide, it is at least guaranteed to take out Gyarados at plus one attack. This means he now 
now has Crobat and Honchcrow left, and he sends in Honchcrow first. Since this thing isn't particularly fast, it gets immediately outsped and destroyed by a rock slide. Finally, I have to deal with Crobat, and despite my speed boosting nature and all those EVs, I still can't outspeed this thing as it hits me with a confused ray. I did stay in knowing that I'd be slower because even though I hit myself in confusion here, it would have been just as bad to swap into confusion as I switch into Altaria. On the switch, however, I do get hit by a toxic. The following turn, I get hit by a cross poison, which does about a quarter of my health, and I go for an ice beam, which doesn't really line up that well with Altaria's mouth. Much like Flamethrower, I kind of wish they were all lined up like Dragon Breath, but beggars can't be choosers. At least this means we beat Cyrus. Don't think that you can defeat or capture that Pokemon. <laughs> Making it on over to Sunny Shore City, we have one more gym to take on, and it's an Electric-type gym. And considering we have Garchomp, one of the strongest ground types overall, if Volkner was depressed before we entered this gym, he's probably molding now. We then take a journey through Victory Road, shortly thereafter arriving at the Pokemon League. But before we can challenge said Pokemon League, we have to fight our rival Barry one last time. And while Barry has collected a pretty diverse team, and even leads with a Pokemon that intimidates Garchomp, however, after after that, I can just set up with a sword stance as he goes for a U-turn and take out most of his team except for Heracross at the end, where I have to swap in Altaria and take it out with a flamethrower. Not exactly rocket science, but beating this fight is huge because this means we only have the final gauntlet left. And so now, all I had to do was make the final preparations. And while it wasn't exactly super difficult to choose my final team, but I did have to finalize their movesets. So for Cloud9, I've got Ice Beam, Flamethrower, and Dragon Pulse for damage, and I threw in growl because I really didn't have another move to put there. I don't expect to use it, but maybe there's a niche situation where it's useful. Second, we've got Sharknado with a pretty standard moveset of Earthquake, Rock Slide, Crunch, and Sword Stance to optimize how much damage we can do. And with that, it's time to take on the Elite Four, first of which is Aaron. His specialty is bug types, and too bad for him that my specialty is stepping on them. He leads with Yon Mega, and I take the first turn to fire off a Rock Slide right away for quad effective damage, taking it out instantly. He then sends in Drapion since it's got the quad effective Ice Fang, but of course I outspeed and take it out with my super effective Stab Earthquake. Third out is Heracross, and expecting it to go for a close combat to get as much damage as possible here, I swap into Cloud9 who can resist it. Close combat is a really strong move, but the drawback is that it lowers your defense and special defense every time you use it. This means Altaria is now completely guaranteed to take out the Heracross in one hit with a Specs Flamethrower. Vespaquin is next, and because I'm choiced, I have have to go for Flamethrower, and unfortunately, it does just shy of enough damage to take out the Vespaquen. It then goes for a Defend Order, which boosts both its defense and special defense. In true Elite Four member fashion, of course Aaron would go for a full restore here, but because of that defend order, we're going to do a little bit less damage with Flamethrower, but it's still going to be enough to do over half, which means we can just come in the next turn with another Flamethrower, taking out the Vespaquen, which only leaves Aaron's Scissor. Scissor being quad weak to fire does not bode well for Aaron, since Cloud9 can just melt his final Pokemon with its eyes. And with that, we go to take on the second Elite Four member, Bertha, with a team full of ground types. And honestly, Honestly, Bertha has a pretty good team. She just doesn't have anything that matches up against any of our Pokemon particularly well. I mean, she does have Ice Fang on her Gliscor, but she doesn't lead with it, and even if she did, we could have just sent in Altaria and taken it out with Ice Beam. But since she doesn't lead with Gliscor, I just decide to send in Sharknado and set up to plus six with Swords Dance. After not getting to use it with Wake, I'm gonna use Swords Dance as much as I can. After tanking a second Earth Power, since the Whizcast so generously set up the Sandstorm for us, and of course a plus six stab earthquake is enough to take out the Whizcash. I can't hit the Gliscor with an earthquake, but I do use a Black Glasses Crunch, which at plus six is enough. Gliscor may have amazing defense, but a plus six hit from Garchomp is pretty tough to tank. In fact, the rest of her team can't handle it, and we win the fight pretty swiftly. Who the heck would want this much fire in their Elite Four chamber? Like, I know you're a fire type trainer, but just imagine all the smoke. Regardless, fire is actually one of the best matchups we could go up against, since it's not only unaffected effective against dragons, we're also super effective with ground. Now, unlike Cyrus's Houndoom, this thing doesn't have Will-O-Wisp, so I can just freely set up a sword stance here, which honestly, I don't even think I need. I'm actually incredibly certain that I could just outspeed and take out every single one of Flint's Pokemon without setting up at all, but like I said, I'm gonna take every opportunity I can to use that sword stance. I'm pretty happy that Flint's a freebie though, since the next two trainers are infamously difficult in Sinnoh. The final Elite Four member we face is Lucian with his Psychic type. 
types, and this is the entire reason I put Crunch in my moveset. Much like Versus Bertha, this time I did give Garchomp the Black Glasses instead of the Soft Sand to boost up those dark type moves, and it lets me outspeed and take out the Mr. Mime in one shot. Espeon is second, and it suffers the same fate. Third out is Bronzong, which I know I'm not going to be able to take out in one hit, so I go for Sword Stance since I know it's not going to be taking me out in one hit as well, but it just goes for a Calm Mind. I then hit it with a plus two Black Glasses boosted Crunch, and it's not quite enough to take it out, leaving it in the red. I do, however, get the bonus defense drop as the Bronzong sets up with Calm Mind. Lucian is of course going to go for a full restore, but this time I will be able to take the Bronzong out because of that defense drop. Next up is Alakazam, and because of the jolly nature and EVs, we can outspeed, and since it's got abysmal defense, we would have taken it out even without the attack boost. His last Pokemon is Gallade, but since we're at plus two, Earthquake is enough to take it out, which means we're finished with the Elite Four. After learning that Gabite couldn't learn Sword Stance, we've definitely made it a lot further than I would have ever expected. And so, with the entire run on the line, it's time to see if we can become the true Garchomp Master versus Cynthia. It all comes down to this, her full team of six versus my full team of two. She starts out with Spiritomb, and I've always wondered, does Spiritomb swirl the other way in Australia? Either way, I set up a Sword Stance the first turn to double my attack as I get hit by a Stab Shadow Ball, which unfortunately does get the special defense drop. I then go for another Sword Stance, getting myself to plus four as I get hit by a Dark Pulse, which does substantially more damage because of that special defense drop, so I'm forced to attack the next turn. For this fight, I've equipped Garchomp with a Soft Stance, to do as much damage with Earthquake as possible. My big fear is that it won't do enough damage to take out the Milotic, but at least it's enough to take out the Spiritomb. She sends in her own Garchomp, but Sharknado has been trained for this moment its entire life. There's no way I was ever going to let this Garchomp get a single turn to do anything, because my Dragon types would have been toast. I do end up doing enough damage to take it out, and my real fear is whether or not I'm going to be able to do the same to this Milotic. I hit my plus four, stab, soft sand boosted Earthquake, Quake, and it was brutal watching this health bar, not knowing whether or not it'll be taken out, but in the end, I do take it out. Fourth out is Togekiss, and we can't hit this thing with an Earthquake, but not for the reason you think. I mean, we obviously can't hit it with an Earthquake since it's a flying type, but I also just ran out of Earthquake PP because I forgot to use an Aether before the fight. And this is pretty bad, since we now don't have a super effective move to hit Lucario with. And in hindsight, I should have definitely swapped out into Altaria here, who would have certainly taken two extreme speeds, but I just go for the crunch instead, which means that unfortunately Lucario is going to take out the remaining 69 HP of Sharknado. It's at least the most fitting way to go. Altaria is up, and even though we're 10 base speed points lower, we can definitely outspeed since we have a maxed out speed stat. And as I take out the Lucario, I do lock myself into Flamethrower because of choice specs, which is fine since Cynthia's final Pokemon. Pokemon is Roserade. I click Flamethrower hoping that I'll have enough power to take it out, but I end up leaving it in the red. And in return, the Roserade hits me with a Toxic to do a bit of damage over time. Now, of course, Cynthia is going to use a full restore at that range, which means we get a free hit in here with Flamethrower. And since I know Cloud9 is faster than Roserade, I can feel the victory upon me as Altaria melts the competition with her eyes. And what a way to do it. And that's how I beat a Pokemon Platinum Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Dragon types. And I'm honestly kind of glad that I messed up during my research, because the truth is, I would have never attempted this run if I knew that Gabite couldn't learn Swords Dance. And listen, if you're at this point in the video and you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, what are you doing? Leave a like or whatever, and tell me in the comments which challenge you would like to see me take on in the video after next video, because I've got a randomizer to get started.